second session of the last day of QAP 2022. So we're going to have two talks in this session. And I just remind you, so if you want to ask any questions, I mean, you can either write them down in the in the chat uh, or the Q&A uh, like dedicated sections, or, and, and we'll see if we have time to ask them at the end to the speakers, or there is also this dedicated um, session uh, there is also this dedicated session later where you can actually go and, and, and talk directly with the speaker. So our first speaker today will be Cambise Jose from uh, Technische Universität München, who will tell us about a, refiner, a refinement of Pinsker's inequality and applications to state tomography. So please go ahead, Cambise. Thanks a lot, Cecilia. And I'd also like to start by thanking the, the organizers for giving me the chance to present my work remotely. And in this talk, I will summarize basically two projects with uh, my collaborators, uh, Daniel Stig Fransa, uh, with the archive number which I wrote here, and another uh, paper with uh, Giacomo De Palma, who, uh, which just got accepted as of yesterday at HP. So the main topic of the talk uh, concerns the tomography of a class of physically relevant quantum states. And let me just um, start by recalling you very briefly what I mean by tomography. So the, the state tomography is a task of uh, finding an efficient uh, representation of a state uh, sigma. Uh, so a classical based representation of the state sigma. Um, and uh, to do so, we are allowed to perform uncorrelated measurements on each uh, uh, separate copy of the state. I forgot to say we have n samples. Um, <clears throat> And those uh, measurements can be made on a, a, an arbitrary basis. Then um, you allow yourself to post-process the outcome using a classical algorithm. And then you construct your estimator sigma hat, which you want to approximate sigma up to some epsilon. So there are several natural questions that can be asked uh, with this task. So first, what is the optimal sample complexity of the task? So what is the best dependence of the number of samples, capital N? on the size of uh, the system, small n, the number of qubits, and on the error epsilon. Uh, what is the computational complexity, which can refer to the cost of preparing sigma, to um, the cost of preparing the measurement, or to the depth of the post-processing classical algorithm? What is the cost of storage? That is the optimal number of real parameters that you need to describe your estimator. And finally, uh, how does the strategy that you devise uh, behave in presence of noise? So we've already heard a lot about uh, classical shadow tomography this week, uh, which is uh, um, a very efficient strategy uh, for tomography. So here the measurements are random single party measurements, uh, which means that for each qubit of each sample, you decide uniformly at random uh, on a party basis to perform the measurement. And for each sample, the post-measurement state will therefore be a tensor product of a single qubit parallel measurements, which are known. Uh, so where the states are known and can be easily stored on a classical computer. Then the post-processing outputs uh, a matrix sigma hat, which will be the uh, average over all the samples of a tensor product of operators, which you can construct from the post-measurement states. And notice here that these operator might not be uh, necessarily semi uh, positive semi-definite, uh, and therefore they will not be states, but they average over both the choice of the local party basis that you use to perform the measurement and on the measurement outcomes will be precisely equal to, to sigma, to the state that you want to learn. And you can say something even more. You can use uh, some powerful concentration inequalities to show that with high probability, uh, the trace distance between any marginal uh, of sigma over a subsystem of size at most small r and the corresponding partial trace uh, of sigma hat will be smaller than epsilon as long as the number of samples scales logarithmically with the number of particles, but exponentially in the size of the regions that you're trying to recover. Okay, so as an example here, um, I, if you, let, let's say that any of those dots is a spin, so it's just a qubit, and you just want to recover um, the state of the system on the red qubits, only three of them, then you will need up to 10 to the power of four um, samples to properly recover that, uh, that marginal. So in fact, you can even prove that this uh, depends on R and on N is essentially tight up to polyrogating overhead, which means that you should not hope for a better strategy as long as your figure of merit is the trace distance 
and uh, if you have no further information on the nature of the state sigma that you're trying to recover. Um, now, if you do know more about the state sigma, you can do better. And so for now on, I will assume that the system is defined over a graph where each vertex corresponds to a qubit. And I will fix a family of elementary interactions. So by this, I mean a family of uh, self-adjoint uh, matrices, EL, L from one to N, which will be defined on neighborhoods of the graph. And uh, I will uh, impose some uh, normalization conditions for this EL. So in particular, they will be orthogonal to each other with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product. And I, I would like to emphasize here that uh, those ELs, they will be known to us. So they are fixed and they are known. And what is unknown is the Hamiltonian of the system. So more precisely, the decomposition of this Hamiltonian um, in the basis of the ELs. And so in other words, you have uh, a known parameter lambda in RM and uh, which describes basically the coefficients of the Hamiltonian in that decomposition and which you want to learn. And in this talk, uh, I will assume that the, the state that I want to learn um, is simply the Gibbs state of that Hamiltonian at the inverse temperature beta of the environment. So here, um, since I'm considering a locally interacting system, the Hamiltonian H will be an extensive uh, quantity and an extensive observable. And by this, I mean that the, the, par the parameter M will scale linearly with the system size. And with this framework, uh, there exists another uh, algorithm which approximates the state sigma on observables that are supported on arbitrary large uh, subsystems and regions uh, whose uh, sample complexity will be polynomial in the number of particles. So in this table, I summarize the two results I just mentioned. So on the one hand, you have uh, shadow tomography, which uh, approximates observables uh, supported on regions of small size um, for any states and whose sample complexity scales logarithmically with the total number of particles, but exponentially in the, in the size of the subregion. On the other hand, you have many body tomography, which allows you to recover any bounded observable, as long as you impose that the state has a Gibbs structure and its sample complexity is, is worse in the number of qubits in the sense that it scales polynomially, but you don't, as I said just now, you don't assume anything on the size of the regions of the observables you want to, to approximate. And in fact, uh, more recently, there has been an improvement of uh, the many body tomography setting where um, as long as you restrict the state you want to learn to be a high temperature Gibbs state, then the sample complexity will be uh, scaling as n log n. Okay, and in fact, you can show that this dependence is uh, optimal, essentially, as long as the figure of merit is the trace distance. So as long as you, you want to recover those uh, bounded observables. Um, and so you can see that there is, uh, you know, you, you, you get better in some sense, but you get worse in some other sense uh, when you compare those two, those two algorithms. And so this raises the question whether you can further relax the class of observables that you want to learn in order to find a recipe that would combine the strengths of both these methods. And from a more practical point of view, you can also think that in a many body scenario, uh, asking for approximations of bounded ob observables might be slightly artificial because what you, what you mostly care about are physical quantities which behave extensively with the system size, such as the magnetization or the energy of your, of your system. So the idea is now to change the figure of merit and see whether we can get a better sample complexity. So the class, as I said, of observables that I want to, uh, I want to learn is uh, of uh, the form of uh, sum of observables OIs, where those OIs can have uh, different properties. So you can take them to be simply supported on um, subregions of uh, small size. So I would call these observables k-local. Uh, but you don't need to, to impose this. You can also uh, impose that they are quasi-local in the sense that the operator norm of those OIs will decrease when the support of the OI increases. Um, you can also not uh, impose that those uh, OIs are supported on geometrically local regions. You might just want them to be supported on small regions, but which might be very far away from each other. And you can even assume that those OIs uh, will be potentially supported on very large regions, as long as the supports between one OI and one OJ uh, don't intersect. So all these classes, uh, all these examples uh, will be um, subclasses of a class of observable that I will call extensive, and then we'll get back to this in a second. Uh, 
Uh, but our main result basically says that for this class of observables, the sample, we can find an algorithm whose sample complexity will be logarithmic with them. Okay, so what do I mean by extensive observable? Uh, to define them, I need to introduce uh, Lipschitz constant of an observable, which is defined as the distance of the observable O uh, from the set of those observables which are supported on the complement of a given vertex J which we will then maximize. So you maximize over all the vertices this distance. And loosely speaking, I will say that an observable O is Lipschitz if its Lipschitz constant is independent of the system size. And then you can show that all the examples, so the four examples I mentioned in the previous slide, all uh, are examples of Lipschitz observables in that sense. And now, just like the, when the trace distance is, um, uh, can be defined as the dual of the set of bounded observables, you can define the dual of um, Lipschitz observables. And this gives you um, a distance on the set of many body quantum states, which I uh, denote by W1, and which is called the quantum Wasserstein distance. And intuitively, you could think of this uh, Wasserstein distance as uh, providing you with a metric on many body quantum states which uh, can measure local perturbations in contrast to the trace distance. So in particular, if you take two states rho and sigma, which differ on at most uh, r qubits, then their Wasserstein distance will be upper bounded by r times their trace distance. So in the worst possible case, you get a bound that scales linearly with a, with a number of particles. And uh, finally, uh, we will modify the figure of merit in the following manner. So we will uh, ask for uh, an estimator sigma hat of the Gibbs state we try to learn, such that the Wasserstein distance between the two states will scale sublinearly with a number of particles. Okay, so this uh, leads us naturally to, to try and find a way to control this Wasserstein distance. And uh, it's instructive to see how one would control the trace distance first. And there is um, this uh, very well-known inequality, which provides you with a bound on the trace distance in terms of the relative entropy, so the so-called pin square inequality, directly um, using the fact that W1 is bounded by n times the trace distance. And knowing that for Gibbs state sigma, the relative entropy essentially behaves linearly with a number of, of, uh, of uh, particles, you would get a control over the Wasserstein distance that would scale as n to the power of three halves. And I remind you that the figure of merit that we have is a dependence uh, that would be linear with n. So this is not good enough for our purposes. And instead, uh, what we will look for is an inequality between, again, the Wasserstein distance and the relative entropy, but where the number of particles now will show up in the square root. Before we were having a number of particles uh, showing up outside of the square root when we were using the, the control of the trace distance in terms of the, of the Wasserstein distance, but now we want it to be inside of the square root. And if we can prove uh, such an inequality with a constant C that hopefully will not depend on the system size, um, we would be able to um, get uh, a linear control of the Wasserstein distance if we further can prove that um, this upper bound here, this relative entropy between the Gibbs state, the unknown Gibbs state, and its estimated state scales like uh, um, epsilon squared times uh, n. So this inequality is called the quantum transport entropy inequality. And our first main result shows that this inequality will hold uh, in some cases. So when the Hamiltonian is made out of commuting terms and uh, when the Gibbs state uh, is at high enough temperature. So the Gibbs state sigma of a commuting Hamiltonian will satisfy the transport entropy inequality on arbitrary graphs, as long as you are above some uh, threshold temperature with a constant that doesn't scale with uh, the system size. And more recently, we also proved that uh, you can also get a transport entropy inequality on one distance for all temperatures, uh, positive temperatures, with a constant that might scale slightly worse. So it will scale as logarithmically with the system size, but this is still good enough for, for our purposes. Okay. So before I come back to our or original state tomography problem, um, I would like to mention that uh, classically, this transport entropy inequality is equivalent to the property that uh, the probability in the state sigma that a Lipschitz function deviates from its mean by a quantity s is upper bounded by exponential of minus s squared divided by n times essentially the Lipschitz constant of the function uh, squared. Uh, 
And uh, in fact, you can recover almost the same bound as I wrote it here in the quantum setting um, at the cost of having to look at uh, Lipschitz constant of a slightly modified version of your observable, which will also depend on the state. But as you can see, when the observable and the state commute, you recover the classical bound essentially. And uh, I just want to briefly mention that um, there has been a lot of work uh, delved on trying to uh, derive uh, similar concentration bounds uh, for local observables O and Gibbs or ground states under various assumptions on their Hamiltonian and on the temperature. And without going through the details of these results, the concentration implied by transport entropy inequalities for Gibbs states uh, would out outperform those bounds in that the class of observables that you can learn um, is, is the, those Lipschitz observables. So they, they are a larger class than all the previously um, class observables which were, which were considered are uh, within that class. Of course, that being said, you would still need to prove a transport entropy inequality to get a bound, but um, the bound you would get is in some sense stronger. And in the, in the paper with Giacomo, we also use this uh, concentration bound to get uh, refinements on, uh, of results on the equivalence between the microcanonical and the canonical ensembles for that class of Lipschitz observables. Uh, I won't have time to delve into this, but I'd be happy to chat with anyone interested later on. So back to our original problem, uh, it remains to control the relative entropy between the state you try to learn and the estimator, sigma hat. And from now on, I will assume that this estimator is itself a Gibbs state uh, of parameter mu, so sigma of mu. And I will define the, the following m-dimensional vector E of lambda with components equal to the average of the elementary interactions EL in the Gibbs state uh, sigma of lambda. So if you define this vector, you can easily upper bound uh, the relative entropy between those two Gibbs states in terms of the inverse temperature, beta, times the product of the L2 norm of lambda minus mu times the L2 norm of E lambda minus E of mu. And uh, you can further control the, the second L2 norm, so the L2 norm between the, uh, the unknown parameter and the parameter of your estimator in terms of the first one, uh, as long as you're at high enough temperature and for commuting Hamiltonians. So if you now put this, uh, this further control into this initial bound, we get a control on the relative entropy between these two Gibbs states uh, in terms of the square of this L2 norm, of the, um, uh, essentially of the error that you make by measuring uh, when you measure these ELs. And as I said, if you, if you now define your estimate to be, to be this sigma of mu, uh, you can then further use, uh, for instance, shadow tomography to control this L2 norm in terms of uh, some approximation parameter epsilon times the square root of the number of terms in your Hamiltonian uh, for a sample complexity that scales logarithmically. So now, if we put everything toge uh, together, we will uh, we finally prove our result, which says that the Wasserstein distance between sigma of lambda and your estimator uh, sigma of mu uh, will scale sublinearly with the system size, as long as the total number of copies of your state that you need to perform the task scales logarithmically. Um, so let me now briefly address the computational complexity of the method. Uh, for this, we rely on the well-known max entropy problem. So this is a complex optimization problem, which uh, basically consists in maximizing the entropy of, of a gift state under the constraint that um, the averages of the elementary interactions, EL, in that gift state uh, are being fixed. And it turns out that the dual of that optimization can be used to redefine the parameter lambda as the minimizer of, uh, of the following target function. And so we can use this, uh, this definition for lambda or this expression for lambda together with a simple gradient descent algorithm, which we initiate at infinite temperature or at the parameter mu equals to zero. Um, and with this gradient descent, we can prove uh, essentially that the, the computational complexity will scale linearly with a number of particles up to poly polylogarithmic overhead. OK, so before wrapping up, I'd like to address uh, the question of whether our method can be used to learn other classes of states than uh, give states of commuting Hamiltonians at high enough temperature. And so first, if we assume that uh, the Hamiltonian is the sum of a commuting Hamiltonian plus a small k-local perturbation, 
uh, v. Uh, the Wasserstein distance, so you can still approximate the, the corresponding Gibbs state sigma, where the perturbation will also appear in the approximation uh, in, as a linear um, um, additive term. Uh, moreover, some recent concentration bounds by uh, Kuwahara and Saito uh, seem to suggest that we should be able to prove transport entropy inequalities uh, beyond the class of commuting, uh, uh, commuting Hamiltonians, but this is still work in progress. Uh, I also like to mention that we can adapt our tools to learn uh, output states of shallow quantum circuits simply by approximating the output state to the circuit by Gibbs state and then run our Gibbs state algorithm there. Um, I'm also happy to chat about this with anyone interested. And the main, I think the main open problem that uh, remains is to try to prove, um, to adapt the method to learn um, Gibbs states of uh, low temperature Gibbs states. So can we, can we define some sort of constrained transport entropy inequality, which would, um, you know, have the information that we know we are at low enough temperature to still be able to run our, our method. So to wrap up, um, I think that the take home message of this work is that uh, quantum optimal transport, so using these Wasserstein distances, uh, provides us with new powerful and simple tools to um, devise some refined tomography algorithms for some specific classes of states, so Gibbs states of high enough temperature, and um, you know, those classes of extensive observables. And so the main result we, we present, I presented here is that uh, that of a tomography algorithm for learning ex those extensive observables uh, at high enough temperature with prob probably optimal sample and computational complexity. And the main technical contribution is this uh, transport entropy inequality, which so far holds for uh, Gibbs states of commuting Hamiltonians at high enough temperature. And I think my time is up, so I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Kambis, for, for this very, very clear talk. Uh, so, I mean, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, maybe I will take the chance that I have the, the, the platform here to ask one. Uh, so I was wondering, you mentioned at some point that this approach to uh, transport cost inequalities um, is actually I mean, better than previously known results in the sense that it's more general, it's covering more cases. And I was wondering in the cases that are actually covered by, by both, uh, is this dependence on like locality or the uh, number of, of bodies uh, like the same, better, worse? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. So indeed you can, I, I went a bit fast here, sorry, but you, so the, the bounds they get for instance, essentially, for example, if you compare with the Kuwahara Seattle result, the, they have to replace the Lipschitz constant by something that will scale very badly with um, the size of the regions where those OIs are defined. So it would also provide you a better dependence on the on those local observables in it. So that they do get a bound that scales like the square of S, but the denominator is worse in that sense. Okay. Okay, thanks. That was exactly my question. Um, okay, so like in order to all have time to switch to the next se session starting in one minute, I suggest that we close it here. And if you have further questions, I joined the Q&A session in one hour and a half with uh, with Combi, so you can ask everything there.